Hello everyone, I'm Jim Januzzi, Professor of Medicine from Harvard Medical School, Staff Cardiologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Deputy Editor at the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, or JAC. I am absolutely thrilled to be joined today by two absolute giants in the field of cardiology and two people who had a remarkable effect on me personally uh, to choose to become a cardiologist, Dr. Eugene Braunwald and Dr. Elliot Antman, both uh, absolutely massive uh, giants in the field of cardiology. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. Terrific. So I am meeting with you today to talk with you about your commentary regarding the recent acute coronary syndrome guideline update. Let me start with Dr. Antman. Um, Elliot, you had in your document um, a wonderful figure that essentially illustrates the long and winding road that we've been on to the current acute coronary syndrome guideline. Can you share an historic perspective as you yourself played a role in earlier iterations of the guidelines? Yes, Jim, uh, thank you for asking that. It's an interesting question. Uh, uh, 35 years ago, the ACC and AHA published the first guideline on what was then simply called myocardial infarction. And about uh, 10 years later, an important bifurcation occurred. One limb was called unstable angina, non-ST elevation MI, and Dr. Bramwald actually chaired the first of the guidelines in that limb. And the other was, of course, ST elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI. And, and I uh, had the honor of chairing that one, and Dr. O'Gara chair, chaired the subsequent ones. A very interesting thing happened with this guideline that uh, we're talking about now, the acute coronary syndrome guideline. The two limbs have converged back into one document called acute coronary syndromes. And probably one of the driving reasons for that was the, the history of biomarkers, a critical tool for the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. Dr. Brownwald was telling me that when he was a medical resident, the biomarker that they used to diagnose myocardial infarction was SGOT. I remember when I was a medical resident, the introduction of CKMB, and that was a, a very important tool for diagnosing myocardial infarction. And Jim, when you were a medical resident, we started to use cardiac-specific troponins. And the first radio immunoassays for cardiac-specific troponins were introduced over 38 years ago. Uh, and we now have very, very high sensitive assays for cardiac-specific troponin, and we can detect microinfarctions, which leads to the very interesting question about what do we call the syndrome when we have a microinfarction, and should we even be using the term unstable angina at this point? So there's no one better to think about that with us than Dr. Brownwell. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and in fact, with increasingly sensitive troponins, it has simplified things to some extent. And Dr. Brownwald, we don't hear very much about unstable angina anymore on the wards, much of what we see is worsening stable angina rather than a truly unstable coronary syndrome. What's your perspective on this? Well, I think that as um, the troponins uh, were, uh, uh, came on the scene, they're much more sensitive than the previous biomarkers. Uh, and uh, it turned out that um, um, patients who were considered to have unstable angina um, with high sensitivity troponins turned out to have uh, NSTE acute coronary syndromes. And um, it, it turned out that uh, uh, these patients uh, had lost myocardium. So they all, virtually all of these patients whom we called unstable angina, and it was a large group of these, um, really had small myocardial infarctions. So th there was no dividing line between NST, uh, SES, 
and unstable angina. And uh, therefore, I think that as time goes on and as uh, the um, um, sensitivities continue to, to be uh, tighter and tighter, um, I think unstable angina will probably disappear. Some, something that many of us working in the biomarker space um, have uh, long expected, but it's taking time to get those really higher and higher sensitivity assays uh, into motion. But, but Elliot, I remember as a resident, a junior resident, when you first published the earliest proponent papers, that really changed the entire space um, with respect to how we think about the diagnosis and management of acute MI. Back then, patients were suffering relatively large infarcts at times, and we would recognize them too late using CK or CKMB. This led to the unfortunate complication of myocardial stunning and heart failure in many of these patients. Um, Dr. Bronwell, why don't we come back to that topic, actually, of myocardial stunning um, and, and the risk for progression to heart failure. Um, what are your pers what's your perspective on this? Well, I think it um, was first uh, discovered in uh, uh, dogs uh, where a brief period of severe ischemia, and by severe, I'm talking about uh, something under 20 minutes um, in the dog, um, uh, leaves the heart in a stunned position, contraction is stopped or is very feeble. And um, it was first thought that th these were myocardial infarcts. But as these uh, studies progressed, it turned out that um, they uh, had a recurrence of um, um, myocardial contraction, and that could take uh, hours uh, or sometimes days. So it wasn't an infarct, uh, but rather it was a stunned infarction is what we called it. Um, and this is seen quite frequently certainly after uh, surgical treatment of uh, coronary disease, stunned myocardia. So uh, uh, in one instance, um, in terms of um, um, unstable angina that's disappearing, on the other hand, um, in stunned myocardia, um, the uh, uh, contraction uh, is returning. And this really helps us to understand the sometimes miraculous recoveries of ejection fraction that we see in people who get timely revascularization, of course. And Elliot, the new guideline really emphasizes the importance for um, timely uh, revascularization as well as treatment of left ventricular dysfunction. Um, what what are your thoughts on this, and and how can we, in a broader sense, think about the prevention of heart failure among our patients with acute coronary syndromes? Yeah, well, thank you, Jim. Uh, the, the The new guideline on ACS is really beautifully written, and it synthesizes so much information. Uh, we we know about the importance of limitation of infarct size, the importance of reduction of cholesterol management of uh, heart failure or prevention of heart failure, antithrombotic therapy. Uh, perhaps we could take a holistic view at this point and say we we have guidelines on primary prevention. We have guidelines on primordial prevention of an acute coronary syndrome. We now have a terrific synthesized guideline on how to manage an acute coronary syndrome if it occurs. And we even have guidelines on secondary prevention and chronic coronary artery disease. 
The call to action at this point is implementation of the recommendations, which are so beautifully written in this suite of guidelines that have really uh, helped us over the last several decades. Uh, at this point, we, we are informed about what we should be doing, and our job is to make it happen for their patients. So we have fewer and fewer episodes of an acute coronary syndrome, and if they do occur, we minimize the consequences of that. Uh, for the patient who has suffered it. This holistic view, um, Elliot, so beautifully described and titled for your, your uh, summary, spans the primordial prevention, primary prevention, secondary prevention. And, and for, for those watching this video, please keep in mind, we have so many tools available to us now, and really it's implementation time to really um, deliver these therapies to our patients. And I love that term holistic view. When I trained under both you and Dr. Brunwald, I remember in fact, Dr. Brunwald, when he was my chief of medicine saying, do not open textbooks. Your patients are where you're going to learn from during your year of internship. That's the holistic view is really looking at your patients and understanding them and treating their risk factors, treating their active disease in order to ultimately keep them out of the final common pathway in cardiovascular disease, which is heart failure, of course. So both of you, thanks so very much for joining me for this summary of your article in Jack, Dr. Eugene Braunwald, Dr. Elliot Antman. Thank you again. I'm Jim Januzzi from Jack. Thank you for viewing.